Ladies and gentlemen, this week on the channel, an epic two-part review of the most controversial Ferrari of the last decade. Oh wait, well since this has come out, they've done the Pura Sangue. Ladies and gentlemen, this week an epic two-part review of the second most, oh, on the 296 as a hybrid V6. This week on the channel, an epic two-part review of the third most controversial Ferrari of the decade. Some love it, some loathe it, and some just don't get it. This is the Roma. It is surely a sign of just how mad the world has been since this car was released that I still consider it to be the brand new Ferrari, when in fact I was lucky enough to be invited on the launch of the Roma three years ago. However, this is my first time back behind the wheel and it's on home turf. And the reason for splitting the review in two is simple. That's because the Roma is a car of two halves. You see, Ferrari have openly stated that the Roma is designed to appeal to the sort of person that might not consider themselves a Ferrari customer. The kind of person for whom a 458, 296, 812 or a Lusso may be far too flamboyant and showy. Instead, the Roma is designed to evoke memories of classic 1960s Grand Tourers, the likes of the Aston Martin DB5, Jaguar E-Type and of course Ferrari's own 275 and Daytona. However, it is still a Ferrari, and though it's the entry point into the range, today that means a twin-turbo 3.9-litre V8 producing 620 horsepower, a top speed of over 199 mile an hour, and a brochure that reads like the notes from a NASA science fair. Today's review is going to be a traditional one, in which I'll introduce you to the car, the specifications, and then show you how it delivers out on the road. It's ideal for those who are considering the Roma as a sports car first and GT second, and also for those who maybe already have another Ferrari and are wondering how the Roma might fit in to their existing lineup. Part two is going to be more of a vlog in which I'll take the Roma up to my roadster meet at Gilt's Garage Cafe. I will be exploring the car's credentials as a long distance cruiser, also talking to my petrol head friends, seeing how they view the car, and also discussing what it would be like to live with as a first Ferrari, seeing how it would feel compared to say a Jaguar or an Aston Martin. So sit back and enjoy part one of my hopefully definitive guide to the not quite so new anymore Ferrari Roma. Exactly how controversial you consider the Roma to be is really a matter of perspective. Sure, it's their first V8 front-engined 2 plus 2 coupe, but they had been making front-engined V8 2 plus 2 convertibles for quite some time, since the introduction of the California back in 2008. Though that does continue to be a car which divides opinion. A cynic might say that there isn't really that much genuinely new about the Roma at all. It's simply a hardtop version of the California's modern day descendant, the Portofino. And in some ways, there is a lot of truth to that. They share large parts of the chassis and the engine is fundamentally the same. But you only need to look at the Roma to realize it is a very different proposition. In stylistic terms, the Roma shares absolutely nothing with the Portofino or in fact any other car in the Ferrari lineup. And I have to applaud them for being so bold and going with a complete clean sheet redesign. I love what they've done and it's a riposte to all those who've complained about Ferrari's recent cars being too fussy, too influenced by aerodynamic requirements. As far as I'm concerned, they've nailed the design brief of a 1960s Grand Tourer. I will admit I have never been quite in love with the shape of the car. The front I think is spectacular and I don't even mind the grille which at launch was rather controversial. It's instead the rear I've never really been in love with and I know it harks back to many a classic Ferrari, the Daytona in particular. I'm just not fond of cars that kind of taper off to nothingness. I feel the same way about the F-Type but in the flesh, particularly in this Bianco Italia, the Roma has presence and from behind it is a rather shapely thing straight on i think it's gorgeous i parked it up next to the scuderia last night and i have to say though they are an entirely different car in concept there is still that ferrari heritage in the roma they did a good job with this 
Though at the time of filming, the Roma Spider has just been announced, taking over from the short-lived Portofino M, three years ago it was the Portofino with which Ferrari were drawing comparisons when it came to the Roma. And so, for this review, it is that car I'm going to continue to reference because that will show you exactly the effort that went in to making this. Though the Roma shares its basic chassis and 2 plus 2 seating with the Portofino, thanks to the fact it is a coupe, it is some 100 kilos lighter, for a grand total in the real world of some 1650. That makes it around 50 kilos lighter than an Aston Martin V8 Vantage F1 edition, about 80 kilos lighter than a Ferrari F12 or 812, and 150 kilos lighter than either a Jaguar F-Type V8 or an Aston Martin DB11 V8. Given the Roma's position as the more understated Ferrari, I was surprised when it was announced there was no mention of hybrid drive or perhaps even a smaller engine. Remember, back then, the V6 had yet to be announced. As I was on the launch, I was able to ask Ferrari directly why it was they'd gone with the V8. And they told me very bluntly that um, they looked at all the parameters required for the Roma, they had a good think about it, a few espressos, and decided the only sensible thing was a twin turbocharged V8. What they didn't tell me at the time, and what they probably already knew, was that the incoming V6, as seen in the 296, was a 120 degree unit. So it's likely you just couldn't package that in this platform. In any case, I'm not complaining because this 3.9 litre twin turbocharged flat plane crank V8 is one of the all time greats. Here it makes 620 CV and a frankly staggering 760 Newton metres of torque or 561 pound foot. To put it another way, that is more than either a 5 litre supercharged V8 F type or the 6.5 litre naturally aspirated V12 812. Ferrari told us that the 20 horsepower gain over the Portofino would have been more like 40 were it not for those meddling petrol particulate filters, which have also robbed the car of some noise. To try and compensate, the rear silencers have essentially been eliminated, and in order to make this a slightly spicier engine, new hardware and software, particularly sensors, were installed to monitor the turbos, allowing them to rev 5,000 RPM higher, making the engine a little bit more exciting at the top end. The other big news for the Roma was the introduction of an all-new 8-speed twin-clutch gearbox. Mechanically similar to that in the SF90, here in the Roma it also features dry sump lubrication, but a mechanical reverse too, which the SF90 does not, instead using its electrical motors. The gearbox, simply put, is witchcraft, because not only is it lighter than the old 7-speed, despite the extra ratio, it's also capable of taking more torque and changing gear even faster brilliant. At the rear you'll find a narrow but reasonably sized boot with plenty of storage capacity and a low load lip. You can fit either a full-sized suitcase in here with no drama or two full-sized carry-ons. The rear seats can be folded down to load bulky items through too. But it was up front in the cockpit where the most dramatic changes were to be found and another area where this car was entirely different to the Portofino. Though a refresh was certainly overdue, with Ferrari having used essentially the same layout since the 458, this wasn't met with universal praise. Certain elements were more welcome than others, including the sort of twin pod arrangement with two individual seats rather than a kind of shared space. I love it. The overall shapes in here are dramatic, interesting, and it is a very exciting place to be. Special mention also should go to the Ferrari Roma's key, which is gorgeous. Old school Ferraris, it was a fairly plain, kind of cheap feeling item, but this is special. It can be stowed in the center console here, and I really do like it. This one has a kind of uh, gray look to it. You can have various different colors. I like the standard Ferrari yellow. The backing is leather, and it's really, really cool. I'm glad they've put effort into this kind of thing. Other gripes I have with this interior? Well, one I should mention because I moaned at Mazda for it, and Ferrari have done the same, so I can't give them a free pass. When you close this door, there is a huge gap here. I mean, absolutely massive. And it's a real shame because it actually ruins the kind of flowing line that this interior has. It's just daft and feels a bit wrong. Though I do love the fact that it's been styled in a kind of bold way so that this little section down here with its silly touch buttons kind of pokes into the door. That's nice, but a big gap like that, that's not cool. 
Compared with, say, the F12, the dash does feel a little bit higher, and you do feel sat very much low down in the car, but the Portofino is much the same way. It still feels like a very intimate cabin. It is a special thing to be in. Most of the material choice I really do like. The leathers are all decent, nice quality, the carbon fibre, the Alcantara, the carpets, they're all good. Love the aluminium pedals. But this headliner, it's sort of weird, scratchy fabric that maybe you could get away in a sort of lightweight car like a Pista or a Speziale, but in Aroma, I don't know what they were thinking. Why that isn't just Alcantara as standard, and I'm sure you can have that, I don't know. But it is an element that I noticed and I wasn't all that impressed with. Still happy though that Ferrari are keeping with the leather bound sun visors and the like. There are plenty of touches in here to remind you you're in something quite special. But let's address the elephant in the room, shall we? Because Ferrari for the Roma went with an all digital display. That isn't controversial and again, was an element that was somewhat overdue. However, the control mechanism for it didn't get much love because Ferrari, unfortunately, decided to go with essentially a series of track pads. Unlike many of VW, these are not touch buttons. They are touch sensitive, but they are track pads. You operate them like so, which is better than in say a Golf. However, a few things to say. First off, for this display in particular, I think a trackpad was the correct solution. It is the easiest way to give you access to all the different functionality that you might have, and it's just a really simple way to do things. I'd have preferred a joystick, but I kind of get why they didn't go with that. However, when it comes to things like the wing mirrors, a trackpad is just a stupid idea. And having all the buttons and things down here be touch sensitive, I just don't like. The little Manatino switch has evolved and now integrated the bumpy road mode into it, which is genius, and I like the fact it's still a physical piece, but I'm not so keen on the fact that the engine start-stop is not anymore. That's a big thing. Starting the engine in a Ferrari, that should have an element of theatre, and kind of just stabbing a hard screen isn't that nice. It's just ergonomically a little bit poor. Nor do I like this, the gear selector. Inspired by the old gated shifters of the past, it looks all right, but these are not sliders, as I thought. They're buttons. Nor am I a big fan of this, a big slab of a thing that's very, very ungainly and such a nice svelte interior. It looks like it's removable, but it's not. Please don't try. And it has all your basic stuff. So you've got your HVAC controls, you've got your nav, you've got your audio, and if you have it, Apple CarPlay as well. But it's just horrid. I hate touchscreen functionality for all that sort of stuff, except Apple CarPlay. And to me, this really is redundant. Even more annoyingly, this car made me feel really stupid because I remember being talked through how all this stuff worked on the launch. And when I got into it, I spent about half an hour trying to find a certain feature. Because like most of these setups, the Ferrari system has a mode where you can press a button and the map will take up the whole screen here. Makes total sense. I couldn't find it. That's because it isn't there anymore. Apparently, Ferrari have removed it, and if you buy a Roma today, you won't get it. And if you had a Roma already, they'll take it away because they couldn't get that functionality to work properly without making everything run really, really slowly. It was a criticism of the system that I had when new that none of it was quite as slick as it should be. It felt like the whole thing just didn't have the processing power that it required. And the fact they've said, yeah, okay, it didn't work very well, we're just gonna take it away, I think is a disaster. To me, if Ferrari had done this correctly, and it's definitely possible to do because others and Ferrari themselves have done it, get rid of this. And if you want your passenger to have something to look at, well, that's what the display over there is for. Though, unsurprisingly, that is an option. So let's talk about those. Here I have the spec sheet for this exact car, and it may be one of the most modestly specified Ferrari press cars I've ever had, which I think is a very good thing because it should demonstrate that you don't need to go too crazy in order still to have the proper experience. One thing I really like about Ferrari is that very, very little on their options list, with the exception of the Fiorano pack you get on some other models, will affect the performance. You buy a Porsche and you want it to do the 0 to 60 times you've seen in the magazine, you need all sorts of extra stuff, chrono pack, dynamic mounts, these sorts of things. 
Ferrari don't do it that way. One thing to note though, this list is a little bit out of date. I cross-referenced it with the current price list and um, it's just a little bit short, so you can add a few percent to all of these prices. In any case, it's near enough that for any potential purchaser, uh, I think it's just about accurate. And of course, it was accurate at the time this car was built. The base price back then was £174,701. Today, your Roma starts at about 182 on the road. And in um, somewhat alphabetical order, or alphabetical code order, this car has front radar with active cruise control. That's £2,755. And then, and this is a shocker for Ferrari types, Apple CarPlay as standard. Previous to this, if you wanted CarPlay, it was £2,500. Android Auto, though, notable by its absence. The car also has the full ADAS package at £5,184, though, um, weirdly, that doesn't include, evidently, the rear radar and blind spot detection. That's £1,574. You have the Rosso Corsa brake calipers, £1,296. The exterior sill kick in carbon fibre, £1,152. The carbon fibre upper tunnel inside, £960. Carbon fibre dashboard inserts, £2,688. Daytona style seats, which I have to say I do really like, £2,832. The embroidered prancing horse on the headrest, £720. The black ceramic exhaust pipes, which I'm not really a big fan of, 960 The advanced front driving camera, again, another thing clearly not in the full ADAS package. That's 1,181, and I think it gives you stuff like reading speed signs and all that stuff. Heat insulating windscreen, £672. Carbon fibre steering wheel with LEDs, that's basically an essential, £2,880. The Scuderia Ferrari shield on the fenders, and those are worth noting because on the launch, Ferrari's press cars did not have those because they felt the Roma wasn't about that sort of thing. And actually, Ferrari purists will tell you only race cars should have those on. I like it on things like the Scuderia, but on the 550, I think it kind of looks better without. In any case, if you want them, they're £1,056. Unless you want the uh, hand airbrushed ones, in which case it's about eight grand. The Magnaride dual mode suspension. This really should be standard Ferrari. I, I think it should. I'd love to try on without, but honestly, who's not going to spec that at £3,168? Electrochromatic rear view mirror, £768. The passenger display, which is either brilliant or a useless gimmick. Your mileage may vary, £3,360. 20 inch forged diamond wheel rims, £4,608. The full electric seats are standard fit for the UK. The foldable back seats, £960, and I think again an essential. The high power hi fi, £3,552. Colour upon request for the stitching, £432. Surround view camera, I do like that, but it is £3,456. quid. Ouch. Anti-theft system, that's standard in the UK. Pirelli tyres, same, no cost. Wireless smartphone charger. That's nice to see in a Ferrari, and for this kind of car, again, very useful. 960 quid, and the active matrix LED headlights, 2,880 pounds. Bringing the total retail price of this car to 224,755 pounds. It's a lot of money, isn't it? I mean, that's essentially double what you could have spent even if you were trying hard on an F-Type. It's going to be, I think, in line with the new Aston Martin DB12 that has more power, but also likely more weight as well. So probably similar performance and nobody's really driven that yet. And I think realistically, this car now, £230,000 most likely, give or take, maybe a little bit more. So, that's an introduction to the car. The last time I drove one of these, back in Italy, I found it to be a charming companion, a fine thing with many great qualities, but I thought it was also dynamically lacking in a few key areas where I know Ferrari can do better. But that was then. What about now? Go 
Good news, everyone. After a modest disappointment in Italy, here in Britain, the Roma has rather redeemed itself. Assuming you've either not seen my original review or that you have and subsequently have forgotten it, for which I won't blame you, it was a long time ago now, I'm going to run through all the stuff that was already brilliant and then I'll talk you through a few of the things that I didn't quite like but now I kind of do. First off, this being a Ferrari, let's talk about the engine. Though it is similar to that in the 488, it puts out a little less power and the car of course weighs a little bit more, which means if you're a numbers fiend, it's a tiny bit less impressive. However, if you don't happen to be holding a stopwatch, it is still absolutely incredible. The thing has pulled from essentially nothing and this is just about one of the few engines where when the manufacturer says it has no turbo lag, I am inclined to believe them. I've pretty much never managed to catch one of these out. It revs all the way to about seven and a half thousand, but truth be told, you don't even need to take it there for this to do the business. And in a car like Aroma, I think that's really important. Where in something like the 488, you could make a valid case for saying, yeah, but I miss the old, lovely, naturally aspirated units with their buzzy top end. Here, I think having a more workable mid-range is of great benefit. But to be quite honest with you, even in the 488, the low and mid-range is absolutely sensational. And like in that car, the Roma also has Ferrari's variable torque deployment. In other words, it's only in 7th and 8th you'll actually get that full 760 Newton meters. And even within a gear, Ferrari have programmed it so that the engine still feels like a naturally aspirated unit. This has a couple of benefits. First off, it makes the whole thing feel a little bit more exciting. Second, it makes it a little bit more manageable. You see, there have been a few modern day turbo engines and the BMW M4, the original, I think was maybe the worst culprit for this, where they just let all the torque arrive when it wanted to. And though that would certainly impress if it was bone dry and you had nice warm sticky rubber on, in just about any other conditions, what that actually produced was a car that was a little bit spiky and unpredictable. And when you're talking about power outputs like this, that just isn't what you want. The Roma still demands respect and I recall on that Italian test drive before we went out they said to us be careful everyone the previous guys that have been I have said it's like driving on ice and we all sort of joked amongst each other and said yeah 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 they don't want us putting our foot down and binning their brand new cars. They weren't joking. It turns out that I think there was some chalk or something like that on the fields and it blown off onto the roads and at many points it really was like driving on ice. You felt like you had no traction whatsoever. And as I was on my first Ferrari press launch and I didn't want to be the first person in the world to destroy a Roma in public, I was being quite respectful. Handily, one of the other advancements of the Roma over the Portofino was in the Manatino. The Portofino only gave you three settings. This gave you the full five as you'd get in anything else. And to demonstrate just how effective the Roma's traction control is, I'm going to put the car into sport mode and now, if we can, give it some beans. That was our first, second and third pull. And I can tell you two things. First off, the Roma is chuffing quick. Absolutely, insanely so. And secondly, that the road conditions in Italy really were holding me back. This thing seems to have absolutely no issue whatsoever finding grip. I put my foot down in first and it was fine. No drama, no fuss, no bother, absolutely brilliant. And that's key because if you are buying this as a first Ferrari or maybe even first performance car, you do want to have confidence in it. But incredible though that engine is, I genuinely believe it's actually overshadowed by the gearbox. Yeah, this eight speed is absolutely brilliant. If you've experienced the seven, you would be just as doubtful as I when Ferrari told you that it was not just a little bit quicker, but like 10, 20% quicker in certain scenarios. That's a massive difference. And I believe them. 
even when you're driving at slow speeds or in say the F12, it'll be slurring the shifts. It'll be doing it kind of smoothly. This, <laughs> that's, that's unbelievably quick. I'm just poodling along. I'm following a Peugeot Boxer van here and the gearbox is super responsive. And I'm also really glad to see that Ferrari have improved their paddles. It's a criticism I have of many of the earlier cars that the shift itself, the action, just isn't quite direct enough. It doesn't feel mechanical enough. It's too sloppy. But here, I do feel like I'm actually doing something mechanical. I know that I'm not. All you're really doing is disengaging a switch or just breaking a sensor contact or something like that. However, here, that's satisfying, really satisfying. The paddles are of a decent size too, so even if you've got a little bit of lock on, you can still get to them. And as is Ferrari tradition, they are mounted to the column, not the wheel. Speaking of which, that is also quite different to those in previous Ferraris in concept. It's still very similar, so all the controls are on it, but along with the new touch buttons, there are a few other features I like as well. The indicators, there's still one on each side, but like in some later model cars, they now have little sort of wings at the back. So you don't necessarily need to push them from the front. You can activate them from the back and that I do quite like. The controls for the stereo, meanwhile, are also different. The ones in the F12, 458, 488 and various other things are lifted directly from a Chrysler. So you get in a Jeep Wrangler or something like that and uh, you'll have the same controls as a F12. They're confusing because on both sides they are the same, so you're always forgetting which is volume, which is track and everything else. Here on the left, you've got a little rotary dial for your volume and on the right, you've got your source forward and backwards, you know, track skip and that I like. The controls for the headlights and the wash wipe, they're all sort of familiar and very intuitive, but there are some minor differences. You've now got scroll wheels for them, which I do quite like, and behind the wheel, you've also got some nice big bumpers. On the left, pull, and it'll give you a flash of the lights, and on the right, it'll give you a single wipe of the windscreen. Hold it, and it'll give you a spray. As we're driving around town, good time to talk about visibility. The driving position in the Roma is quite nice. You do feel very cocooned in this car. Compared to, say, the F12, it feels a, a little bit tighter, a little bit smaller in here. Wow, that's a bold color combo on that Renault. Kind of love it, though. 996 GT3 RS Tribute Edition, evidently. My favorite bit about the Roma, I think, in terms of the driving position, is the view out the front. The F12s is very nice, don't get me wrong, but this is next level special. It's a really sharply sculpted front with a very pronounced kind of power bulge in the middle and is heavily reminiscent of the view you get in the 550. Three quarter visibility is not quite so good and directly out the back is okay, but for parking, you'll definitely be grateful for all the extra functionality that the car has with the 360 cameras, sensors, and the like. Next, and this I think is the element of the Roma that along with the gearbox surprised me the most the ride comfort. When we collected our cars, it was in a beautiful little Italian hotel with the classic kind of piazza out the front, which was covered in cobbles. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, great. I'm going to drive this car over the worst surface imaginable as the first thing I do with it, which is going to show up every single rattle, creak, squeak this car has and probably ruin my idea of just how comfortable the thing is. Well, the joke was on me because the Roma took it in its stride. I actually would believe that Ferrari had deliberately picked that setting to show just how good the suspension is. Comfort mode really does what it says on the tin. Now, of course, around town and at low speeds, there is still an edge of firmness, such as the price to pay for a car with this kind of performance. But it's never jarring. It's never unpleasant. It's a country mile away from the likes of the Maserati MC20 and even things like the Jaguar F-Type. Truthfully, I think it's only the Aston Martins that can really compare in terms of the sophistication of their ride. This is a masterclass. The benefit of that nice sculpted front end is that for bits of road like this, where it gets quite narrow, you can place the car fairly well. That means that although it is a big wide thing and you are very aware of that at all times, it isn't quite as daunting as say the F12, which can be a little bit scary on occasion, especially through this section here. 
the standard fit carbon ceramic brakes are very well mannered at low speed, nice and progressive, not overly servoed. The pedals themselves are nicely spaced too, so you can drive this in pretty much any kind of footwear that you might imagine. And as we're now at one of my favourite little bits of B-Road, time to put my foot down again and find out what the Roma's like in the bins, because this is where it let me down last time. yet to visit the factory, it is on the cards, I do happen to know that the roads and the hills around Marinello are very much like these, tight, twisty, quite demanding, often poorly paved and full of potholes. And so for that reason, the Roma feels like it is absolutely at home right here on the back roads of Britain. It makes very, very light work of just about any stretch of tarmac you might imagine. It is daft quick this thing. I mean really seriously fast. I am having to hold myself back quite a bit because I put my foot down earlier and the speeds you get to are utterly incredible. But that doesn't mean to say that it's a car that's not involving or engaging, far from it. The Roma was deliberately tuned to have steering a little bit less frantic than in some other Ferraris, but by just about any normal metric, it's still quick, it's still very sensitive. And it was actually that steering that I had the biggest problems with, I think, in Italy. Here, it is better, although I will say still not brilliant. It falls some way short of the F12's hydraulic setup. It's similar really to that in the 812, so at low speed actually there's quite a bit of waiting and it's full of promise and feel and you're really quite excited about it. But when you start to press on it does feel as if its grip on the road loosens ever so slightly. It becomes a, a little less talkative. It doesn't go entirely silent, you've still got a good idea of what's going on, you know how close to the limit or not you are but it just isn't the best. I would say this is an area where Aston Martin and even I think Jaguar do beat the Ferrari, but it's not enough to ruin the experience. And I'm pretty certain that it is better than in Italy. The road surface there certainly would have had an impact on the way that the car felt. Even so, at very modest speeds and doing 34 mile an hour right now, the car's still plenty engaging. The gearbox is a big part of that. The fact it's still keen to shift quickly with even very, very modest throttle inputs means that you can drive the thing at kind of four tenths and it's still fun. overtakes are ludicrously easy. Just pick your gear, and you don't really need to get it all that right. Find your moment and put your foot down, you're past. Done. <laughs> The car does feel just about as wide as I think you can get away with on many a B-road, and I'm sure there are certain people out there, perhaps living in the Cotswolds and the like, where you do get narrow roads, big stone walls, and they're unforgiving things, those, and maybe this might feel just a tad intimidating. The likes of, say, the old Maserati Gran Turismo, and even the F-Type and the XK, are a little bit narrower, and you do appreciate that at certain moments. Here, though, not an issue. The seats I need to give mention to, they're not my favourite, Ferrari seats, but they're also not my least favourite. I think I actually prefer them over the ones in the F12. And that's just as well, because in the Roma, you don't have a choice. You can change the trim of them, but the seat itself is pretty much always going to be the same. <laughs> I know it's dry today and warm and sunny and the tyres are hot and everything, but even so, there's a lot of power going through just two wheels, and this makes the whole thing feel so effortless. What a machine. But is it perfect? Well, no. There are a few things that do still bug me. Number one of which is the noise. 
it's just not that exciting. The 488 still makes a great sound, but the F8, which also had particular filters, was so muted, it didn't really sound like much of anything. I appreciate their arms are tied. Let's face it, when the rules weren't quite so restrictive, Ferrari did some absolutely obscene things. The 430 Scuderia, 458 Speciali are daft loud, so much so you can't actually take them on many British racetracks. This I don't think you'd have the same issue, but I would be really, really tempted if I had one of these to put an exhaust on it because unlike, say, the Maserati MC20, the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio, you can make this sound nice. Those will just get louder, but this you can really improve. Novatec have a system which sounds absolutely superb and I think is probably the one that I would have. They also do a little lip spoiler for the back that gives the car just that little kick and normally I wouldn't really be into any sort of modifications or body kit stuff for a Ferrari but for me personally I think that really fixes a little bit that was lacking in the car. Another thing I know I haven't mentioned at all today is the, uh, the little rear wing. It is very, very unusual for Ferrari to have a wing on a car. They just don't tend to do it. It's not their thing. But for this, they have. However, Ferrari being Ferrari, you can't control it. It will do its own thing as and when it wants to. So it goes up when it wants to, goes down when it wants to, and it has multiple positions depending on the speed that you're doing. And I actually like the fact that they've set it so that when you are driving around town, it just disappears, vanishes, and if you were to look at the car, you wouldn't really even know that it was there. I have already given this infotainment setup a little bit of a battering, but it is a major gripe. I mean, this centre screen here, it already looks absolutely awful. Even a little bit of sunlight in here, and it's kind of difficult to see. You get fingerprint smudges all over it, and I know that's not really unique to this setup, but it is just really, really annoying. To do basic things like change the temperature in the cabin is just needlessly difficult. I do also think it's a disappointment that they took away the big maximum screen setting for the dash. That really is the whole point of having an all digital dash because at the minute you could have had essentially the same setup as before with a nice analog taco in the middle and then a pair of screens either side. I've got to confess, given the nature of Ferrari's options list, I'm surprised when you go to change the color of the taco, it doesn't ask you to put your credit card details in. Another minor gripe, the hill hold assist is very inconsistent. It will work for a very, very short period of time, but I do wish the car had a setting where it would just engage the parking brake automatically. It's got one, but it only actually works when you're turning the car off. Porsche have a nice system where you come to a junction, just put your foot on the brake all the way down, and it will put the parking brake on for you, and that I would appreciate. There's been a few moments where I thought the car was uh, you know, sorted, and then it suddenly started rolling back towards the person behind me, and uh, I apologize if that was you. I didn't realize it was going to do that. The F12 have kind of gotten used to it, but in the Roma, I thought it would be better. And I suppose I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention the fact that on the very first day, with this car having gone out, taken it to the shops, I came back to it, got in it, and it greeted me with an electrical system failure warning. Go to dealer, it said. And that's frustrating. Now, I've gotten used to warnings like that with the F12. It happens every now and again, but that car's got an ancient battery in it. It's on its original one. This doesn't have that excuse. This is a Ferrari press car. This will be in tip-top condition. And I haven't been stupid. I hadn't left the ignition on for ages. I hadn't done anything like that. I've been there before and I've learned my lesson. This just did it. No reason whatsoever. And that's frustrating because I really hope Ferrari would have learned. And that sort of stuff I know would put people off. I mean, can you imagine if you'd gone on a test drive and the first thing you were greeted with was an electrical system failure warning? I've got to the point now where I know these cars well enough, the, nothing was obviously wrong, turn it off, turn it on again, the warning went away and the car was absolutely fine for the rest of the day and hasn't given me an issue since. But still, it shouldn't have happened. Ferrari, please, you need to sort these things out. Today's video is aimed primarily at those who maybe already have a Ferrari, and so you'll be used to that kind of silly stuff. How does the Roma fit on a driveway that's already got a prancing horse? Well, I think very well indeed. 
this is a supremely usable car. I even took it, don't tell Ferrari, into a multi-story car park. And that was important to do because that's the exact sort of thing I tell people not to do in any Ferrari. And with the Roma, you can't actually even specify a suspension lifter. Ferrari UK's PR department like not specking their cars with it to kind of prove a point, but I'm eternally petrified that I am going to wreck one of their cars. But in spite of this, the Roma did really, really well. It's comfortable, it's usable, it's quiet. The JBL Hi-Fi is decent, though it doesn't have Android Auto. My phone will stream music and it's perfectly good enough. Most of the silly controls down here, once you've set them up, you can kind of ignore them. And even the trackpad system for the steering wheel, I actually get on with just fine. I don't have a problem with it. I did actually spend quite a bit of time last night watching as the sun was setting this and the Scuderia parked next to it, just admiring the beautiful lines on them both. And I thought, you know, actually, if you had to build the kind of two-car Ferrari garage, that'd be a perfect pairing because the Scuderia is all loud, raw, shouty. It's all about putting your foot down. And it's a very, very exciting thing to do that in. The harder you drive, the better it gets. But in this, you can drive it at four tenths, five tenths, have a great time. And maybe at eight, nine tenths, that's where it's not quite so good. But that's where the Scuderia is brilliant. This is totally usable. If you have kids, you can easily, easily get them in the back. The car has Isofix in it. The boot is usable. If you've got big, unusual, bulky stuff, you can drop the rear seats. You could maybe take this to Ikea. It's a little smaller, it's a little friendlier to drive than the likes of an FF or a Lusso. Although, <clears throat> just in case you were thinking that because this is a V8, it's going to be better on fuel, don't kid yourself. I haven't done enough miles in it yet to be able to deliver a rough verdict. I might try and talk about that more in the next video. But I have enough experience with Ferraris of all types, including the Portofino, to tell me that um, they're tragic on fuel. Every single one of them. The tank here is 80 litres, so it should give you decent cruising range, but it might tell you everything you need to know that when the car arrived on my driveway with a full tank, the predicted range was just 250 miles. Drinks like a Ferrari this, goes like a Ferrari this. And actually, if you know your back catalogue, I know many people drew comparisons between it and the F-Type, it looks like a Ferrari too. And this is because, as far as I'm concerned, the Roma is a proper Ferrari. And I have to say, I'm grateful for a second stab at it because I think I've found myself falling for it even more. So, that being said, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to carry on enjoying it. And if you'd like to hear more about this car as a long distance cruiser and daily proposition, please make sure to check out part two when it's released. But for now, I want to say a big thanks to Ferrari UK for lending me the car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.